independence did not bring much change in terms of the economic programs of the new nation. Private ownership of the means of production was left to the old ways of loans rather than equity. Bailouts in agriculture continued. The rural road access for transporting goods were poor, almost with an attitude that should have been very different to that of Sir Edward Denham, but was not. The vast majority of the rural peasantry were ignored, and migration to the cities, especially Kingston, quickly overwhelmed the social infrastructure. In hindsight, the admonitions of Edward Siaga and Dudley Thompson were coming home to roost. Incentives to foreign capital were accelerated, and the local investment climate was not planned so as to produce sustainable development. Education did not address the need for the new scientific and technical skills associated with the division of Arthur Lewis or the industrial reorganization in America envisioned by Frederick Winslow Taylor. Our few graduates found easy and lucrative employment elsewhere, and our main high schools continued to imitate old British grammar schools. Andrew Downs, in an analysis of the Arthur Lewis program, offered the opinion that local capital continued to be risk averse. He further stated, and I quote, with the low levels of per capita income, the low levels of savings will be insufficient to meet the level of industrialization needed to resolve the unemployment problems, end of quote. The country's choices thus far seem to indicate a preference for extractive industries. Sugar, built on free slave labor, bauxite, tourism, the short-lived garment industry, and now ICT bring no technology that is owned by us. The profits are not retained, and only wages, usually low by our expectations, and utilities remain here. In contrast, the company model tries to do the reverse, and I'll indicate in two diagrams. I have depicted these in a way that will remind us all <clears throat> of the triangular slave trade that brought most of our ancestors here under duress. I guess the company's way was somewhat a reversal of the dependency on the extractive industries and a reversal of the slave trade. The strategy almost sees, seems to be colonization in reverse. Not the brutal kind, but rather a way of expanding markets and keeping the profits and innovation here in Jamaica. If this strategy continues to allow growth, then the over 60 countries that they do business with will soon grow again. From one market to 66 in a relatively short time is remarkable, but has been a task to keep human resources expanding while maintaining the company's core values in a very different society. The first diagram really is Jamaica's position and it shows that external markets have patented technology, capital, and the knowledge of world markets. They come to Jamaica where we have idle local capital, sometimes, low-skilled labor, raw materials, and tax incentives. The intermediate goods produced go to somewhere else where they are transformed further by high-skilled labor and final transformation by advanced technology and the profits from that return to the external markets. In the case of the Grace Kennedy model, Grace Kennedy has the capital, high-skilled labor, and ideas. The capital, ideas, and high-value added products and services are transformed through the company's subsidiaries and distribution intermediaries by high-skilled labor, trade incentives via external bilateral agreements. They are sold in high value added markets external to Jamaica and the profits are returned here and retained by the company in Jamaica. 
<clears throat> Douglas Hall quotes, and I quote, the most damaging consequence of powerful colonialism such as the British exercise is the encouragement it gives to imitation and the deterrence to creativity. Authority lies in the metropolis. Colonial action is subject to that authority. And since the metropolis is most likely to approve attitudes and institutions which are similar to, or at least not incompatible with its own, colonial breeds a tendency to imitation rather than creativity." <coughs> End of quotation. The company stopped mainly to core businesses that did not require heavy long-term asset commitment. The industries followed the pattern of supplying the food markets and certain areas of the financial services. The reasonably quick cash flows helped the company to weather the many changes that were characteristic of the 1970s and 1980s. <clears throat> Buzz phrase was cash is king and Ralph Diaz's succinct statement that profit is an opinion but cash is a fact <laughs> was never more important at the time. The ever-expanding services and products were designed to fulfill needs that were not yet met. <clears throat> and our consumers were kings. This decision regarding careful cash management afforded the company genuine flexibility in the turbulent two decades. And while other companies folded, Grace Kennedy continued its strategy for gaining market share at home and overseas, helped by the loyal support of our Jamaican and Caribbean diaspora. The benefits of the Bustamante Kennedy Alliance, previously mentioned, and the foresight of the Matalon family allowed port facilities to move into the modern era of container handling and transshipment. It must represent one of the best public-private investment projects in the history of independent Jamaica. <coughs> On the other hand, tourism replicated the extractive downsides as ownership and incentives favored foreign entities and imports, thereby bringing little improvement for local suppliers of local food, furniture, and other capital goods. The delivery of promises intermittently enticed many to get near the promised windfalls without the commensurate living infrastructure. This encouraged the rapid development of poverty, poor living conditions, and eventually social tensions that soon descended to tribalism and gang violence. The Cold War and the need to choose sides did not put the, company, the country in line for any real developmental assistance. Bustamante announced his allegiance to the West in 1962. Michael Manley seemingly turned somewhat left and in the face of serious opposition turned to non-alignment. The accompanying turbulent conditions stimulated another round of skills migration, mainly to North America. The Grace Kennedy strategy of expanding and protecting island-wide expansion of goods resulted in an urgent need to fill the vacuum created by migration by opening cash and carry wholesale operations in Kingston, St. Anne's Bay, Montego Bay, Frome, and Mandeville. At the end of the crisis, these were sold to staff members who remain loyal customers. It is worthwhile to note that during this difficult period, the company did not resort to layoffs. And this strategy allowed for the retention of experienced employees who might otherwise have migrated. This bold move paid off greatly when market conditions returned to normality. With the assistance of the private sector leadership Edward Siaga embraced Ronald Reagan, and Jamaica was rewarded with the Caribbean Basin Initiative 
a one-way free trade agreement. The country failed to make this into a meaningful export growth market due to the lack of preparedness of manufacturers and low productivity in general and poor government inspection and regulation. The failure of smaller family firms to find ways to meaningfully integrate strained capital, increased borrowing, and stretch the available skilled managerial and labor pool beyond acceptable limits.